Okay, thank you. We're ready to start. I want to begin by thanking Valeria and Massimo for inviting me to say a few words uh, before, um, before Professor Chomsky gives his talk. I'm, uh, my name is J.P. Jones. I'm the Dean of the College of Social Behavioral Sciences, and um, uh, it's a pleasure uh, for me to uh, come here this afternoon and recognize uh, Tom for um, uh, 80 years of continuous progress. Um, and, um, you know, it came to my attention that um, linguistics is a, uh, a discipline of longevity. Uh, maybe there's some kind of uh, genetic selection uh, there um, going in one direction or the other. Um, it also occurred to me that it might not be a very demanding discipline. So, um, and can do it for a really long time and, you know, and so on. Um, I can't really speak uh, to Tom's research. I won't do that. But um, I, I've come to know him uh, personally over the last 10 years, uh, uh, collaborating on a whole bunch of um, projects. And, um, and one of the things I can say about Tom is that um, he's never uh, absent of ideas. He, has a, he generates a lot of ideas. Uh, and then he is um, quite persistent in pursuing them. And he pursues them, I think, something somewhere between an engineer, like he found a problem and he's going to solve it, and a lawyer uh, who kind of grabs on and won't let go. And that's a left brain, right brain thing there that might also co correlate to left handed, right handed. I don't know, you have to talk to Tom about that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I did read the CV. Um, but. Um, you know, I spent, uh, well, I spent the better part of a summer once trying to get an MRI to move from Abu Dhabi to Tucson. You know, that was like, uh, that was one of Tom's ideas. That one, that one didn't work. Uh, others obviously um, have worked. Um, if you've ever had idea exchange with Tom, you will know that you may get three emails before you can finish the one in response to him. So, uh, and I will also say one other thing about Tom is that whenever he schedules a meeting with me, um, we always block, it's always for a half hour, but we block the next hour, you know, because um, we know that it's always, it's always going to run over in, in a good way. Um, and, um, you know, it's, uh, um, of course, um, one of those ideas that worked out uh, marvelously for the university and for the department is uh, Tom's um, work. And I, I don't know how many of the people here in the, in the room actually know how much uh, effort, uh, and actually patient effort, that Tom uh, uh, put into um, uh, finding a, um, an academic home and also a, a personal home for Noam and Valeria Chomsky. They, they, he really uh, did um, a, um, a, a tremendous amount of work there that maybe a lot of people in the, uh, at, at the university, maybe even in the linguistics department, uh, don't realize. And then I think it's fair to say that that activated or reactivated um, a love for uh, undergraduate teaching, which he's doing this uh, year with Noam and with uh, Massimo, and um, also uh, integrates um, uh, undergraduate education with um, with uh, community members, and um, we had a very large group of, uh, of people who have been uh, who have been mixing in that sort of uh, generationally bimodal uh, classroom. And uh, I appreciate all your uh, inventiveness and effort in, in, in that, and also the fact that we get to uh, share known with not only undergraduates but with um, with community members. Uh, and then there's um, you know your more um, your more recent title as co-director of the Center for Consciousness Studies, and your, uh, I'm sure it was a, uh, there was some work there to move the Center for Consciousness Studies from the College of Medicine uh, over, to, uh, uh, over to the college, and, and you're um, uh, co-directing that. And I think that that, in collaboration with Stuart Hammeroff in the Department of Anesthesiology, is going to be a very productive um, uh, thing not only for pushing the boundaries of that field, which essentially we could in fact say, I think uh, Chris Maloney would agree with me, um, was founded 
uh, at the University of Arizona in the mid-90s and uh, continues to thrive in um, all kinds of interesting, wild and woolly ways. So, um, uh, Tom, um, I want to uh, congratulate you uh, on your uh, upcoming birthday. I know Noam also uh, needs to have uh, people sing for him because his birthday is tomorrow. Um, and um, and um, it's also, uh, you know, uh, an honor really to come in uh, and to uh, say a few words. So thank you, Massimo and, and Valeria, for that uh, honor. And so I was told that Noam needs no introduction, and so I think that's right. He is uh, the Professor Laureate of Linguistics and the uh, Agnes Noam's Howard Chair in Environment and Social Justice at the University of Arizona. So, Noam. Well, uh, am I supposed to use this? Yeah. Can you hear me in the back? Well, when I started thinking about uh, how to uh, arrange an introduction for Tom, I realized that there's a serious quandary. Uh, there is a standard format for introductions. You start by listing the person's uh, academic qualifications, uh, run through the CV and so on, but you all know that and that would be boring, so I'll skip that part. And the next thing you turn to is uh, the list of, uh, uh, of uh, area, scientific areas where the person has made significant contributions. But here's where the quandary arises. It turns out that would be too long and I only have a certain amount of time to talk. So I figured the next best thing is to try to list the fields in which Tom didn't make a contribution. <laughs> but it turns out that's too short, so I can't do that. In fact, about the only one I could think of, and I'll probably be contradicted, was philately. Ever seen? <laughs> okay. So uh, I guess the next thing that's possible is to... Put the microphone closer. closer. Oh, the next thing that's possible is to... Uh, try to think of Tom's major accomplishment. And that one turns out to be pretty easy. It's something that I suspect none of you know. It's not in print. Uh, you all know about uh, W.V. Quine, great philosopher leading uh, American uh, philosopher of language and mind in the 20th century. Uh, Quine had a, a lot of his work was about language. And he had a very rigid, uh, position on language, uh, well thought out, argued, and so on. Uh, the position was, there's nothing you can say about language. Uh, other subjects, you can have sciences. Uh, they, they are subject to what's called underdetermination. You never have enough evidence to prove things. But in the study of language, it goes beyond underdetermination. It goes to what he called indeterminacy. Uh, a lethal problem. There are simply no facts of the matter. Uh, everything you say about it is just convention. And that was kind of the centerpiece of his uh, philosophy of language. He's also well known never to have changed his mind on anything, uh, but certainly not on the centerpiece, except once. Uh, Tom did an experiment uh, which uh, showed uh, that when you hear sentences with a click interspersed. You, the perception of the click is shifted to the phrase, to the edge of the phrase. When Quine thought about that, he immediately said, okay, there is something you can say about language. It has phrases. I think that's the first and only time that he changed his mind about anything, and this happened to be on a fundamental issue. Now, that experiment had a lot of uh, implications. It says a lot about, not just about language, but also about perception. And uh, I think the jury, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the jury is still out on some of the significant questions that can be raised uh, about what uh, linguists among you will recognize to be what are called ECM constructions. Sentences like, uh, John expects Bill to leave, where the question is, is the and it's an open question, is the phrase boundary after uh, Bill, 
uh, John expects Bill because it turns out that what appears in that position acts as though it's in the higher clause, or is it before Bill? So the phrase is, Bill expect to leave, because that's where the semantics is. And I, I think that question no, is still before. open. Yeah, can't, don't have an answer. I'll send you the paper. Oh, you have an answer, okay. How about philately? <laughs> uh, well, uh, that was a major contribution to the study of perception, also language. Uh, but phrases we're sort of familiar with, so maybe not all that surprising. Uh, but Tom went on to much more subtle questions. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, in Italian, there's very strong, and Italian type languages, there's very strong direct evidence that in a sentence like uh, uh, several tall men arrived, uh, the phrase several tall men is really in the object position after arrive. You don't hear it there, but there's strong evidence that that's where it is. Now it's been assumed that the same is true in English, uh, English type languages, even though the evidence is very thin and indirect. But actually Tom succeeded in establishing it by very <laughs> clever priming experiments, uh, which showed that uh, uh, in fact uh, where you're perceiving the phrase that's in the surface subject position is actually in the object position. Now that's, uh, again, a major contribution to study of perception, why do things work like that, and tells you something important about language, solves an interesting problem. Well, he went on from there to even more subtle cases which require a, a serious understanding of both linguistics and uh, smart experimental ideas to show that there's even distinctions between different kinds of unheard posi empty positions, those which linguists will recognize as A and A bar positions. Again, that's all of these are a combination of uh, very uh, smart uh, uh, experimental ideas with uh, serious knowledge of what matters in the language system. Subtle, you don't hear it, but it's, there's evidence that it's there somewhere. This shows strikingly that it is. Uh, these paradigm could go on to address other open questions uh, for linguists among you. The, there's a big debate about uh, the question of the relation between raise, what's called raising and control. Uh, that could conceivably be addressed by similar qu uh, procedures to see if you, what kind of a gap you have in the position that's left. Well, uh, could go on with a lot of uh, constructive ideas, but uh, one of Tom's endearing characteristics that he also likes to destroy things. <laughs> and so he's also, he's, in fact, he uh, said that his parents had a premonition when they named him Thomas. He wants to doubt everything. Uh, one of the things he doubts is the pretty solid uh, uh, consensus on brain localization. And uh, Tom's addressed this in a number of ways. Uh, one of them is through the study of handedness, which uh, JP mentioned. Not the simple question of what left-handers do. Uh, that's too easy, and besides, it turns out from his work, it doesn't tell you anything much. But the more subtle question of uh, what's called familial left-handedness, like did your uncle, was your uncle left-handed? And uh, you do a study of that over a big population, you get measures of familial left-handedness, and that turns out to have some surprising consequences, which Tom's brought out about uh, the question of localization and what it's doing. He's also raised a, a question which is quite difficult to deal with, when you're studying localization, are you studying what people do or what people know? That's a very hard, I mean, it's, you can make the distinction in the study of behavior and uh, dealing with uh, people's responses. In fact, Tom made some major contributions to that, uh, for example, in his uh, investigation, in his discovery and investigation of uh, what are called uh, 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 garden path sentences things like uh, the horse raced past the barn fell. 
where what you perceive is an error, because there's a sentence, the horse raced past the barn, and what's Phil doing there? So it's not a sentence, but in your mind, uh, unavailable to your consciousness, it, you know that it is a sentence, and that can be brought out by further experimentation. But what's going on when we do investigations of the brain? Well, we're always studying performance. Uh, how do we draw conclusions about that from, about the nature of what your actual uh, unconscious knowledge is? It's a question that, uh, that uh, Tom's explored, and I think it's an open, serious question. Not very clear how to proceed to answer it. There has to be an answer. It's there somewhere. But uh, how do you find out where it is? Well, uh, I got to know this side of Tom's character about 60 years ago. Uh, he was a student in the first class that we had at MIT. There's a background to that. Uh, MIT, is a, it's kind of a strange miracle that MIT even had a, has a linguistics department. Uh, back in the late 1950s, uh, Morris Halley, my old friend Morris Halley and I were the so-called senior linguists our late 20s, very arrogant. Uh, we decided why not have a linguistics department. Totally crazy idea. Uh, we were unknown in the field. We couldn't publish in linguistics journals. Uh, MIT is about the craziest place you can imagine for a linguistics department. There's no library, don't teach any languages and so on. Those surrounding disciplines didn't exist then, philosophy, psychology. But we figured uh, in our arrogance, why not try? And it happened to be a very supportive place. So uh, uh, we actually first tried to have a one PhD student, Bob Lees, who many of you know, who some of us, uh, one, one of our good friends happened to be a, a chair of the electrical engineering department. So he agreed to accept the thesis on uh, the grammar of English nominalizations. And, uh, uh, electrical engineering department. I think there were some pretty surprised parents when they were sitting there uh, reading the, at the graduation, reading the interesting thesis titles. Uh, but uh, after that, the department came along. And then the question is, why on earth would anybody come? Uh, we just assume maybe they would, a place where no one's ever heard of and so on. And to our surprise, uh, we had a, a class of very good students, in fact, remarkable students, which is perhaps not so surprising because nobody else would have ever thought of coming there. Why go to a crazy place like that? Uh, Tom was one. Uh, all of them turned out to have very distinguished careers in various areas. Uh, but, and the classes were quite exciting. The uh, field was just beginning to develop then, so lots of things happening. But there was something disconcerting, uh, seeing one person sitting in the class with a slight frown and shaking his head, saying, I don't believe that. And uh, even more disconcerting, often turning out to be right. And uh, now you're going to hear his latest thoughts on uh, what's wrong with a whole long series of disciplines uh, and how we can uh, remedy it. So, your turn. <laughs> uh, well, as I was just saying, Noam just gave half my talk, uh, which is good because it was too long anyway. Uh, so uh, let me uh, just start by giving maybe five or ten minutes. Is there a problem? Massimo, do you want a mic? <laughs> uh, okay. So I'm going to speak for five or ten minutes about some personal background issues related to what Noam was discussing, uh, and then turn to some topics that I think are important today. I am sort of, I will quickly go past uh, what some people have claimed to be my accomplishments, uh, uh, which Noam has already exaggerated. Uh, and um, get to 
topics that I think are worth my time at any rate at the moment actually to investigate today because I think they're ongoing problems. And I think that technology is helping us uh, to do much better in investigating them than we have in the past. So this is me uh, with my male parent. Uh, maybe is there a way of turning this light off? It makes it, it seems to be making that pretty dim, unless it puts everybody to sleep. Okay. So if you look carefully at my expression, uh, <laughs> you'll see that I was a little uncertain about what was going to happen because I knew exactly what was going to happen. Uh, my father was brought up in Europe, and uh, there's a particular way that children are abused by their male parents. Uh, which consists of putting uh, the fists on either cheek and then rubbing like this. Uh, and so I knew what was coming, uh, <laughs> but uh, tried to be polite. Here's a better look at uh, <laughs> uh, what was going on and, and how I felt about it. Uh, so there's something to what Noam said, that, that my stance, I don't think because of this particular class of events, but for other reasons, uh, I've, I have been in the role of being skeptical. Uh, but really, uh, we, we come here today because ostensibly, and I appreciate so many people coming, uh, ostensibly because it's my birthday. But really, it's, a, it's everybody's birthday in this room. Uh, the uh, uh, way of looking at it is to ask, you know, how many linguistics departments were there in 1939 when I was born? Don't know, 10, 20? very small number worldwide. Uh, and today, according to Wikipedia, there are at least 300. Uh, so something happened, uh, something to do with one or more people in this room. Uh, but at the time, in that general era, uh, Leonard Bloomfield, who was what the major uh, linguist of his day, with good reason, uh, he is reputed to have said to some aspiring student who came to discuss linguistics with him. He said, young man, go into linguistics as a career only if you have no moral alternative. <laughs> uh, because it wasn't really a, recognized as a field. It lived within anthropology departments and, and language departments and so on uh, in the hearts and minds of people who had a bead on the importance of studying language. So a uh, little one more bit about me, and then I'll go to some current stuff. So I was incredibly lucky. Uh, I mean, it's just amazing. If you, I guess we all have pathways uh, and, and can see how luck played a role in wherever we are and, and whatever we're doing. But this is, in my opinion, was pretty extraordinary within this restricted world. So I was present at the famous uh, uh, we could call it interview, or you could call it joust, or you could call it destruction, uh, of uh, the ideas that Skinner was proposing in general about stimulus response psychology, where Skinner had, uh, been, been, uh, had the temerity to apply uh, his ideas to language. Uh, and uh, that, of course, they didn't work, for, to say the least. Uh, and Noam was invited by George Miller in his graduate class that I had shoehorned myself into. Uh, on the psychology of language to have a special meeting, and I was there. And I thought, I mean, you know, I mean, Noam was, he was 29 or something like that at the time. Uh, Skinner was 60 and very much in his prime and uh, very pleased with himself. Uh, and um, uh, it, it, it's like one of these cartoons where the, one of the characters, is, has, his head is sliced off and his neck is sliced off and so on and so on. And then suddenly somewhere in the cartoon, everything clatters down. Uh, well, that's what happened to Skinner intellectually. He had no idea that that's what had happened, but the rest of us did. And then I had an amazing sequence of advisors. I ended up with Morris uh, for undergraduate. Roman was a real trip. He was, he was my advisor for two years, but and there are lots of stories I could tell about that. It would be much more fun than this talk, but nonetheless, <laughs> I won't. Uh, but uh, when I went to, I would met uh, uh, Morris through, because Morris was Noam's favorite student, uh, sorry, Jacobson's favorite student, um, and I was doing some projects and so on that Morris was interested in. And that led me to 
join the uh, linguistics department at, at MIT. So there I was with, with Noam giving lectures on syntax and everybody in the room was going, uh-huh, uh-huh, I see. And I didn't understand beans. Uh, I thought syntax was this mysterious cult in which, pe which people talked about the, what they called linguistic intuitions that were like vaporous. I mean, they were, it, it went away. Uh, and some of them had such clear, strong intuitions and such strong beliefs in this versus that. I decided, I, I mean, it's gonna take me a while. I better study something else within the framework of this program. Uh, and that was phonology with Morris, which was much more concrete. You knew, when you, you knew when you got a better answer. You didn't know when you got the right answer. Uh, but at least you knew that answer A was better than answer B. Uh, and that was very comforting. And then I, later on, I just had wonderful, amazing collaborators. No mentioned uh, the research on uh, click mislocation and its bearing on uh, the processing evidence for actual phrases and phrase structure and how it works. Well, that was research that was partially invented by Merrill. Uh, often the, the pastors of Illinois uh, and in a speech department yet. Uh, it shows you something about Merrill, and he was really knew how to invent stuff. And Jerry, uh, who does do a lot more than, or did do a lot more than just tell jokes, uh, although he's very good at that. Uh, and with Jacques Mailer, who became a lifelong uh, collaborator, both in practical issues like starting the journal of Cognition and in a lot of research in different areas. And then I just had this raft of other collaborators. I won't talk about every one. Uh, but, of course, in fact, I won't even talk about one. Uh, but I've highlighted some of those who probably are known to, to many of you. Uh, it's really an amazing array. It's just a fantastic initial luck and a series of very fortunate uh, happenstances after that. So I will practice Cicerone and Praetorician for those of you who studied Latin. Uh, uh, on... Um, various areas that I've worked in that Noam already discussed, so I'm not going to say beans about it. Uh, uh, the Ciceronian Praetorician comes from Cicero's introduction to his attack on a corrupt Roman, uh, in which he says, I'm not going to say all the things that are wrong with you. I won't say this, I won't say that, I won't say all the bad things he did. Well, okay, so I'm not going to talk about all the good things that people say I've done, but there's a bit. Um, and um, the reason is, I think, not, not, it's not necessarily boring, but uh, I don't know about the answer to that one, but uh, it's not really what I'm focusing on today. I mean, life is a journey, and my profession is a journey, and my research is a journey, and I'm trying to move ahead. But I will mention one thing, uh, which is about this sentence. I mean, 300 years from now, uh, when uh, the real theory of language and how universal laws created and all that has been well understood and Noam is a name for the uh, scholars uh, who reach back in time as to how all of these important things were discovered. The one thing that everybody will still remember, probably, or still keep re-remembering, is colorless green ideas sleep furiously. That's an, you know, it's, a, it's just such a pungent example. Well, I have created, just by accident, when I was shaving once to try to make a point for a class I was teaching, uh, a lesser example, but an example nonetheless that I feel is gonna go on my epitaph, uh, if anything does, and that's the horse race past the barn fell. Uh, it's, a, it's, a widely under, it's a widely quoted example because of the points it makes. Uh, and one of the questions, the interesting question is, why is it such a ringer? Why is it so hard, unless you're really treating it in a scholarly way, to recognize that it's grammatical? And I'll just say in a short form, the reason is, I think, that the correct analysis actually embeds the incorrect analysis. Uh, so you start with an incorrect surface analysis thinking that the horse race that passed the barn, is the, that's it, that's the sentence. Then you discover there's this thing fell at the end. Uh, and so you have to recompute it. And when you recompute it, the correct analysis, the horse that was raced past the barn, 
brings you back to a causative construction, namely, the horse raced past the barn. Namely, was caused, the horse that was caused to race past the barn. And so it brings you back to that same sequence, uh, and I think that's probably the reason why it's such a pungent example of a garden path sentence that you can't, very, except as a scholarly matter, it's very hard to undo it intuitively. Okay, so that's an aside, if this thing will let me go on. Okay, so, so much for the background and past and all that. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today are three areas of uh, research that I hope will occupy me for the next five to ten years, or more. <laughs> After all, I have such a terrific example leading me. Uh, so uh, I, I won't read them all because I think I'll just launch right into one. Uh, so the first is a perennial problem. Uh, we have a formal grammar. I use the word formal <coughs> simply to distinguish it from a behavioral model or a neurological model. Uh, and uh, this raises a lot of uh, puzzling questions, uh, namely how it uh, can be embedded or possibly be irrelevant or possibly be sitting on the side uh, in one of those Marian uh, universes, that's from the theoretician Mar, a visual scientist and computer scientist. Uh, so what is the relationship between uh, this very intricate, interesting, exciting model of what language is in relation to what the brain and the kids do when they learn it and so on. And so there have been history of failures, history of a very simple-minded, and we look back and can say that, uh, ideas about the relation of grammar and behavior that failed uh, against facts. I mean, they didn't fail because people got tired of them. They failed because they actually could generate some pr predictions that turned, just turned out to be wrong. And as Noam implied, I played some role in showing that it was wrong. Um, and the other problem is that, uh, well, firstly, the prob one of the problems about the whole question, it used to be called, is grammar psychologically real? That was the question. Well, it was an, a way of framing research but in point of fact, linguistic intuitions, the belief that if I know English, this is a sentence and that isn't a sentence, and this could become a sentence if we change it this way and, you know, and so on, uh, these are all as real as experimental results. In fact, as I suggest here, maybe they're more real uh, because you can quickly get them and then you can quickly uh, think of counterexamples if there are counterexamples to be thought of and move on to the next I theoretical idea without having to design an experiment, go in the laboratory, run the pilot experiment, run the real experiment, do the statistics according to the latest statistical model, send it off to a journal, get it back with bad reviews, but one good review, and so they encourage you to revise it, so you revise it, and then you send it. And about three years later, after you initially started, something gets published, you show it to the linguists, and they say, as in the Nixon White House, oh, that idea isn't operative anymore. Uh, so the thing that you were testing the reality of had evaporated uh, into uh, a new theory. And so let's look briefly at the history of uh, different architectures that have been proposed for, uh, within the framework of generative syntax and, and just ask simply, you know, what is consistent across these models, some of which are so different from each other. So it starts in the public world with syntactic structures with a big thing, pile of papers called Logical Structure of Linguistic Theory lurking behind it, uh, at which really created the, the first major revolution in the, in the context of linguistics of the day. And then various other models uh, that uh, in each case one way or another were argued uh, to uh, involve a simplification. Generative semantics was argued that way. It turned out that it was actually the opposite, uh, but that's another story. Uh, government and binding theory, so-called, and we arrive today at minimalism, so-called. It's called that because it's supposed to be the most elegant, simple, direct uh, model of, that will tell us what the structure of language is. But of course, it's the best model so far. You know, who knows what's coming down the pike. Uh, 
But the major features of this model, are, there, there are two of them that we can isolate, there's more, but it's basically simple, that's the point. So there's one, uh, one structure building uh, computational process, uh, which is recursive merge or recursive merges, one or two types, but basically very related. Uh, and the other is one kind of structural process, which is the principle that uh, linguistic uh, representation and language uh, is uh, structure dependent, that is to say dependent on hierarchical organization, not on serial organization, even though the language that we are presented with, certainly in the auditory mode, is massively serial. Uh, so what I'd like to do is to uh, play a, a, a demonstration by Monse Sands, who's sitting over there, uh, uh, with whom I did some of the work that Noam uh, cites on uh, telicity and related uh, phenomena, uh, just to clarify the nature of the problem. So here's, here's going to be an example of uh, building a sentence. Uh, and what Monse did with this example is to uh, give us a, 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 an acoustic rendering of each operation. So that's when you put two things together, basically. Uh, I don't know why she chose the camera shutter, but there was a reason, I'm sure. Uh, and then after that, you, you pull things out of a lexicon somewhere and add them in. Uh, and then uh, you have to make sure that the car hierarchical structure with the lexical items in it is conforming to certain kinds of restrictions. Boom. It says potential spam. <laughs> How did they know? Uh, okay, so then we, we're checking agreement between units. Uh, okay, that's checking, all right. And then finally you're getting ready and actually moving something from one position to another. Okay, so here goes the um, derivation for a three-word sentence in Spanish. Uh, the boy arrived. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it, it's, I'm, it, I'm going to play the sequence of operations as fast as PowerPoint will let me do it, which is, of course, obviously, if it were really what we do in our minds or head, wouldn't be near fast enough. Okay, so you firstly, in this particular version of uh, minimalism, which has changed somewhat in the last few years, but it's basically still related, is you, you grab a bunch of lexical items that are going to be in the sentence, and then you do this. <laughs> okay, I have to say this is, this is pure genius on, <laughs> on Monse's part. Uh, just fantastic. Well, anyway, so what do all the models have in common? I mean, trying to not so much worry about a particular uh, syntactic set of processes, but looking back from today to 19, the mid-1950s, looking at what's sort of consistently played a role in these differently configured architectures of how a grammar, work, a grammar works, major feature is their derivations. Sentences are the result of building structures. Uh, and uh, that's a constant in, in these different models. Uh, and I think it's, it's not entirely unique to generative, uh, so-called generative uh, grammar viewpoints, but I think it's intrinsically characteristic of the generative viewpoint, of the generative program. Uh, and so uh, one of the uh, lines of research that I won't go through in, in any detail, but just I'll refer to it, was first to try to demonstrate that derivations in one form or another actually are computed during uh, different kinds of language behavior. And I, I won't, that's an entirely separate lecture of its own because it involves a lot of technical stuff as well as various kinds of experimentation. But the fact is there is some evidence for that. Not enough to convince everybody, but I frankly think there never will be enough to convince everybody. But uh, there is some, and so we, in my view, we have to take the concept of derivation seriously. Well then the problem that we're faced with is language behavior goes very quickly. I don't think you're aware of applying a whole bunch of things like what Monse was depicting, even if you're doing it really fast, uh, as you 
uh, listen to my, me talking and you understand what I'm saying. And what's interesting is that you understand what I'm saying intuitively, you understand it instantly. And th so the question is, uh, how would we mate that intuition with some evidence that in fact you're also assigning derivations of this massive complexity in almost all cases to sentences that you've never heard before. Uh, and so there's a, there's a real conceptual problem in model building. And here's an ugly solution. The ugly solution is that there's a dual root, which is not the first time it's been proposed in cognitive science. Uh, and, uh, uh, or especially in, in, in language behavior and so on, that uh, we um, understand sentences initially by applying certain kinds of statistically uh, well-founded practice, lubricated and so on, patterns. This is very basically pattern recognition. Uh, and then that leads us to an immediate interpretation of the meaning, but then there's evidence that in fact a few hundred milliseconds later uh, the uh, aspects of a representation of a sentence that themselves depend on a derivation come into being in the, in the mental representation in the mind. And so uh, it's at that point uh, that, that we uh, have this kind of idea that uh, to, in a, putting it sort of crudely that we understand everything twice. Once with rather simple direct pattern recognition and the other with more elaborate computational uh, derivations. Um, and there is a, there's evidence to a number of the kinds of predictions that this makes. A simple demonstration is a sentence like, the double take sentences like, more people have gone to Russia than I have. That's obviously grammatical, right? More people have gone to Russia than I have. Well. It, at first, in general, people say, oh yeah, that's a sentence. And then, wait a minute, that's not a sentence. That doesn't mean anything. Uh, and so the point is that it, it looks like a sentence because it conforms to the surface pattern, but when you then try to put the pieces together, uh, you realize it's not working right. Uh, and so there are other phenomena that may be uh, related to this. Uh, and so, uh, again, how it would, uh, would create understanding of why the horse raced past the barn fell uh, is such a difficult sentence to recognize. Okay, so this is an example of uh, analysis by synthesis, which is a model that, with that name or not with that name, pops up in many different areas of cognitive science, uh, not just language. Uh, because there, there are dual or multiple roots in perception and, uh, and uh, understanding the world as to how we do it. Uh, and so integrating those roots uh, requires either to say, I don't think most of those roots are important, it's only this one that's important, uh, or to try to construct a model that at least allows you how to put them in relation to each other potentially. Of course, we're not at the end. Uh, of, th of this way of thinking. Uh, there are other pr issues like how do we integrate this kind of model <coughs> with discourse on the one hand and with neurological uh, evidence that is uh, constantly emerging every day on the other hand. Okay, the second point I want to uh, discuss, second kind of research, is the issue that Noam mentioned uh, related to familial handedness. And the thing that's interesting about that uh, is that uh, if there are effects uh, on how you organize, represent behaviorally and neuro neurologically language, even though you're strongly right-handed, if there are differences in how you do that as a function of handedness background, if you have left-handers in your background, that's the, the left-handers in your background serves as a kind of proxy for some variability in genetic uh, inheritance, uh, or in how you grow up in a family, possibly. I mean, we don't, you know, it could be a mixture. Uh, and so it, it gives us a tool uh, for uh, geneticists, because what geneticists constantly clamor for uh, when trying to find the genetic basis for uh, a, um, 
a skill, a cognitive capacity that's unique in our case to humans, uh, they say, give us a phenotype. We need phenotypic variation that's well, that's well defined. Then if we have people of type A, people of type B, we can now do genome-wide stuff and all that stuff that they do uh, and try to pick out uh, uh, different uh, particular peculiarities uh, in the DNA of, of group A versus group B. But we need a clear phenotypic differ differentiation first. The interesting thing about uh, uh, people with, that's FS plus, and people without, uh, uh, lexic uh, without uh, familial uh, ha left-handedness somewhere in their family envelope, their recent family envelope, um, is it's almost 50-50. So almost half the right-handers report <coughs> one or more left-handers in this envelope. And uh, that gives us an enormous population base uh, with a lot of complexity, of course, and difficulties that follow with that. Uh, but it has at least that advantage compared with using particular syndromes like Williams syndrome or even Down syndrome or other cases uh, that are, are very well defined in many cases, although not, all, not always, uh, but uh, which are fortunately, uh, in those cases, rare, uh, which makes it harder to do genetic analysis. Uh, so, ooh, uh, it also brings out the difficulties in spelling sometimes. Uh, so, um, the question that's raised, and I'm going to give you some evidence that uh, there are neurological and behavioral differences, the, the big question that's raised is are there implications and what are they for the usual belief uh, that we are really studying one brain and one representation, one place where re language is represented and its name is Broca's area and maybe Wernicke's area and maybe some pathways between them and maybe some other stuff uh, that surrounds them, uh, but that basically it, it's all the same for everybody it, within some normal variation but it's basically the same framework for everybody. Uh, and that, of course, leads to, if that was true, which it may be, it leads to some relatively lazy thinking about uh, the, uh, why it is that humans have uh, the ability for language and it's unique. The answer would be, oh, well, it's because we have this unique, particular, universal neurological organization. Well, that doesn't really answer the question, does it? It just says, We've got this, if it's true, constant neurological organization, and we all have language. We don't understand beads about either, so they must be the same. Uh, and it's not the first area where that kind of reasoning is uh, prolific. So, uh, but at any rate, the first question is, are, is there, are there real differences between these two uh, types of right-handers? Uh, and so, uh, uh, I will, oh wait, I think I'm supposed to, I think I'm supposed to go actually to a different file here now to give you some evidence, if I haven't lost it, just a minute, uh, what is that, I think that's it, is that it, no, that's not it, must be this, let's hope, okay, I have to go back to the beginning, Okay, yeah, so this is just one experiment to give you an idea of the kind of evidence that we have. And I have to, to put it on because it's a different kind of system. Here we are. So um, there's a phenomenon called the early left anterior negativity, which I believe was actually discovered, or at least published, and that's what counts, uh, here by two people who were sitting next to each other, among others, and, and the guy over there, namely uh, Janet, Andy, and Ken. Oh, Janet, Andy, Ken, and Meryl. <laughs> My God. Uh, so, uh, and this, uh, I, of course I was happy to pick this because I knew of its lineage. On the other hand, there are people who for years were building their careers about neuro in neurolinguistics on this phenomenon. Uh, so it was, it, it was a very important uh, discovery or creation. Uh, and uh, the idea, uh, the fact is, that when you present somebody with a, a slight kind of ungrammatical 
point in a, in a sequence, uh, it occasions uh, a, a left anterior, yeah, these guys in the EEG world make negativity go up. Uh, the reason they do that is because when they got started, they thought it was all about electrons. And electrons are negative, and so there's more electrons, so it should go up. Uh, so uh, uh, that's why this response here uh, is higher. It's more negative uh, in, in this way of presenting things at the frontal uh, left area. Uh, so here's an example. This is from German uh, of an ungrammatical sentence. So in German, you can say uh, the trumpet was blown, that sequence of words, but you can tr also say the, the trombone, in this case, the trombone was at the concert blown. But if you don't get the concert in there, if you just say the trombone was at the blown, that's ungrammatical. I mean, as soon as you hear the word blown, uh, it, it's not a grammatical sentence. So here's an example. Die Trompete wurde geblasen. So that's the trumpet was blown. Die Posaune wurde zur geblasen. So the, trom the Posaune, trombone, was zur, that's German, the preposition zu, der, put together in zur, that's the at the, uh, blown. So that's ungrammatical. Uh, and that elicits the, uh, the typical uh, early left anterior negativity. A different group uh, in Leipzig uh, also found a corresponding kind of response in the case of music, but it was in the right hemisphere, uh, so-called early right anterior negativity, if a musical sequence had some kind of anomaly. Okay, that's normal, right? Boring, but normal. Uh, okay, here's one that's not quite so normal. Exactly, ooh. <laughs> but not dissonant, just, just not right. <laughs> uh, and so that is the kind of stimulus which typically elicits the early right anterior negativity. Well, I was visiting uh, Leipzig, uh, the institute where, in fact, Federici is and others. Uh, including the group that was doing this with music, and they were telling me that even the ELAN has a lot of subject variability. Statistically, it exists, but there are quite a few subjects that show, if anything, the opposite, they were telling me. And similarly, even more strongly in the case of the early right anterior negativity for music. So I, with my uh, belief in the universal elixir, uh, so the universal scientific elixir of familial handedness said, aha, let's differentiate the subjects according to familial handedness, which nobody does. Everybody says, oh, we should only use right-handers. They all know enough to know that. Uh, but nobody thinks about uh, the possibility that there are different flavors of right-handedness. So we did that. Uh, and uh, here's a description of the experiment. Uh, we had a bunch of sentences that were normal. Die Maus wurde gefangen. That's the mouse was caught. Der Fußball wurde vorm gefangen. That's the incorrect one. The, the football was before the caught. If you had said the football was before the fence caught, that would be German. Uh, and then the subjects thought that they were detecting a change of voice. Die Torte wurde gebacken. The cake was baked. Uh, and so they thought they were just to push a button whenever there was a voice change. Uh, well, here is a depiction of the data in the um, millisecond range for the early left anterior negativity. And this is the data for uh, the uh, subjects without familiar left-handedness. And this is whether uh, the anterior negativity was primarily left. Uh, and you can see that out of 24 subjects, uh, without, familial, without reported familial left-handedness, it was quite a preponderance. But if you look at people with familial left-handedness, uh, you see that it was really nothing there, certainly nothing statistically. Uh, and so uh, that was a clue that, uh, that, that this, to why there's variability that's generally reported in the ELAN. Well, then we did the same with music. Okay. Again, not awful, but just slightly wrong. 
Uh, and then in this case, they thought that they were detecting a change in the instrumentation. Okay, so, and this is what we got. Now the important thing about this result is uh, this. You think about somebody who's right-handed and they had left-handed fam uh, familial member, uh, left-handed family members, and you think, well, maybe they just use their right hemisphere for more of everything. Uh, and that's why they don't show a strong left anterior negativity. Uh, and so we would predict that they would show an even stronger right anterior negativity to music. But notice the opposite happens. Uh, and that suggests that uh, what's at issue is um, some, to some extent the possibility of reorganization as a function of familial left-handedness. Not just that you use your right hemisphere more for everything, but something about using it maybe more for language results in other kinds of uh, organization for other kinds of cognitive skills and possibly an overall difference in organization. So one of the things we did to try to increase the power of what we're doing, uh, this was with a very, very brilliant uh, graduate student, Roland Hancock, uh, constructed, we constructed a genomic model of the risk for left-handedness, basically collecting uh, family data from, what I, by the time this was done, I think 12,000 undergraduates, uh, probably noisy, probably incorrect in many cases, and missing things, and so on. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, getting some report on which of their family tree, depicted here, really uh, had, had left-handers, applying a standard methodology uh, for computing risk based on uh, heredity, family, family traits. Uh, and now we can ask, is there a correlation between, uh, instead of just asking, are there left-handed family members in your background, but rather creating a uh, continuous scale of the risk that you would have been left-handed, because in that population of 12,000, roughly 1,200 or a little more, were probably left-handed. So now you can compare, compare the pattern of left-handedness in their family background against the pattern of uh, uh, explicit right-handers, uh, and you can uh, see but you're basically looking at the left-handers only to compute this function. Uh, what, is the, what are the patterns that result in explicit left-handedness? Uh, and so that is a way of measuring the risk, as the geneticists put it, not that being left-handed is risky, uh, but uh, what do they know? Uh, so um, it, you, you, you compute the genetic risk uh, uh, for having been left-handed even though you now are right-handed. And so now we can correlate that metric against the uh, 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 increase or decrease, sorry, the increase in left, as it goes up, in a left anterior negativity for music, but a decrease in left anterior and, uh, uh, negativity for language. And you see, I should have put all the little dots here, uh, just not, not the solid lines, but there, there's a... There are, there's a significant difference in the correlations at any rate. Um, so, as I say, uh, this suggests that there really is a reorganization, not just you use your right hemisphere more. Okay, so now back to this. Where am I? Here. Okay. So what do we do about this? Well, we don't, we, there's a lot more work to be done. Uh, so in the case of language, we don't know what it is that leads to uh, f people with familiar left-handedness actually accessing lexical items faster and better and more strongly. I didn't show you experiments about that because of time, but that's a very strong finding uh, across a wide range of paradigms. So it, it, we don't know the, it, whether the nature of the lexical representation that they access is really syntactically bound or whether it's associative, for example. I mean, so uh, the way in which people with familiar left-handedness go after lexical items is uh, 
uh, based on their imagery, image imagery or their complex associations with other ideas or knowledge, uh, or whether it really is indicative and reflective of syntactic-based uh, kinds of characteristics that lexical item has, lexical items have. Well, that's, that's an empirical question, and uh, there are ways of testing it, which I'm beginning to work on. Okay, so now, that's that. Yeah, as it says, more research needed. There we are. <laughs> uh, so there's still work to be done. Finally, the last ta point uh, bears on issues of consciousness and related things. Uh, and um, the most important point of this, I won't take time to read everything on the slide, the most important point is the question of whether context actually in a sentence that you're hearing or in sentences can work backwards without your being aware of that. In other words, we think that we understand everything that we hear as we hear it. We think there's a pairing of the acoustics with at least the word representation uh, as the acoustics comes in. We hear the, the noises and it automatically gives us the words uh, and maybe to some extent even automatically gives us the meaning at least of the phrases as they come in. Uh, and what I'm going to show is I think some evidence that that's just not that simple. So here are some data that was provided uh, by Natasha um, from her studies. She brings a uh, subject into the lab uh, and with prearrangement uh, has the subject call a friend and has an, a sort of gossip session with the friend. Uh, and uh, pretty soon, presumably at first, the conversation's a little stilted. The subjects know that some graduate students are gonna be pawing over whatever they're saying. Uh, <coughs> but then after a while, it gets pretty natural. Uh, they um, are just gossiping away. And Natasha's interested in particular uh, things that have to do with uh, uh, the timing and compression of particular uh, elements of interest. Uh, but what I was interested in is uh, looking into the question of whether snippets simply are impossible to understand by themselves that they depend on context. So here's something taken out of a context. I can make it a little louder, I think. Okay, that sequence corresponds to four syllables, arguably four words, or two words, but two words, each of which is a contraction of two words. So you can think of it either way. I'll play it once more. Okay, so here's the larger context. But either way, it was, I mean, I can't register in person, so they're just going to have to deal with that. Gonna have to. Gonna have to. Gonna have to. It's gonna have to. Uh, I'll play it once more. Okay, here's another example. Uh, see. I guess that's as loud as it's going to get. You can think, uh, I think it's up to the point where it's going to distort, but you can try it. Okay. Oh, that's much better. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Okay, this, is, this corresponds to also four words. <laughs> uh, you should think Southern California, that might help. I can give you that general context. Or uh, Tuesday night uh, when we were chilling in the spa, but... Chilling, chilling in the, chilling in the, chilling in the, uh, is what that little snippet is. So the point is, <coughs> When it's in the context, in this case preceding and following, uh, it's just like that. You don't realize that most of what you thought you heard wasn't there. Uh, what was there were cues that could be related to other parts that had cues that you could put together into a, a conscious representation. Part of the very interesting property being 
that you're, re in a sense, retrospectively recreating uh, the uh, conscious experience, which is a bit creepy. Uh, okay, I'll already explain this. Now here's an example <coughs> where the only context uh, is what follows. And this is why, I, in part, I'm very interested in the issue of a backwards context impact on our consciousness, our conscious experience of language. Your turn. I'll make, I'll make it a little less loud. Oops, too loud. Your turn. Your turn. Any takers? Okay, now listen to this. It's also four words. Do you have time to talk to me for a little while? Do you have time? Do you have time? There's a little bit of a nasal there. Do you have time? Yeah, that's the M. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, other things, but uh, uh, the point is, I, I really don't think that, Do you have time to talk to me for a that there's a sensation that I, I had no idea what I heard. Oh, now I know. That's not the, that's not the phenomenology of this. Uh, and that's, I think, really important, in part just because it, it's weird uh, and not what we might expect, and in part because maybe we can use it as a tool to explore uh, a little bit more about conscious experience. Uh, but before I get to that, for the linguists in the audience, uh, always preoccupied with the poverty of the stimulus, uh, to show how important our knowledge of language that we have innately is, uh, we all think, no, I'm sorry, we don't all think this, but number, a number of people think that mothers and fathers uh, really make it easy for the child to learn language. Not necessarily because everything they say is grammatical, but because they really pronounce it all very carefully with exaggerated intonation uh, and so on and so on. Well, uh, here's an example of, this is from Real Motherese, which I simply captured from a database called Childus. Um, uh, which suggests what I think we knew anyway. Well, how are we doing? That's only three words. Okay, here's the uh, longer uh, sentence, and as I pointed out at other times when discussing this, I'm very glad I didn't have this mother. Uh, <laughs> And when you hear how she, what she was actually saying, you'll understand why. Well, great, mommy moved those magazines so you couldn't get them in Ripple. You get that? I'll play it again. This is a mother who's very pleased with herself from having made it difficult for the kid to do something that the kid wants to do. Oh, great, she says. Sounds well, great, mommy moved those magazines so you couldn't get them in Ripple. It's the Enripum. <laughs> okay, so you understand the point. Now the problem is how to how do you how to turn this into a a um, how to turn this into a, a, a scientific uh, investigation. One way is to go back to the 1950s when all you had to do to get a grant was to spell your name properly uh, and uh, hire. Uh, a raft of graduate students who would listen to uh, hours of tapes that uh, uh, Natasha and her students generate and classify them all and pick out particular uh, subsequences that you're looking for as to help us define what is the unit over which forward and or backward processing can occur. Well, it's a, it, there are a number of different uh, options and I'll mention a few of them. Uh, I'm going to take a side swipe at feed forward as the uh, universal uh, solution to all these kinds of problems because we're looking at feed backward. Uh, so what's at issue is feeding, <laughs> uh, whether it's forward or backward. And um, uh, I just have an aside, which is if you think about what the kid has to be doing, uh, if you go back to the kid example, the kid um, 
we think, the usual thing that's thought, and when Noam gives examples of the poverty of the stimulus, the words are always clearly uh, assumed to have been properly recognized. The problem was to get the uh, compositional constraints right. But the words aren't there. So what on earth is a two-year-old, a one-and-a-half-year-old, what does the one-and-a-half-year-old have to do to figure out this now multi-layer uh, perceptual problem? Uh, and uh, I think it brings in the possibility that in fact structure dependence, the uh, automatic uh, recognition and computing uh, language in terms of hierarchical organization, in terms of phrases, in other words, is something that is already available by the end of the first year of life. Because the child has to be doing something, has to have some concept of unit within which uh, uh, context can play a role in order to even get at the words, to then have the problem of figuring out the constraints, assuming that there really is a problem. So. Here's how we can turn it into a experimental paradigm. We've just started doing it. So these examples are pretty crude. They do sound better on earphones than uh, in, uh, and I won't explain much about them yet. So just listen to this sentence. Our visiting cousin fixed the tent in the large fender before our trip. Okay. Meryl's looking puzzled. <laughs> uh, some of you are not looking puzzled. And maybe you should. Uh, okay, so that is supposed to be the, the seminar of the fix the dent in the large fender. Okay, here's a corresponding uh, sentence. Oops, where is it? Our visiting cousin fixed the tent in the large campground. Okay, that's supposed to be the tent. Uh, well, uh, really, what's going on here? This our is a visiting cousin fixed the tent in the large fender before our trip. Our visiting cousin fixed the tent in the large campground. Okay. Thank you. So what's going on here? Why is, why is Jay's name popping up there? <laughs> You'll see why in a minute, I guess. Uh, is our visiting cousin fixed the tent in the large fender before our trip. Okay, wait a minute. Let me just turn this down. This, this thing insists that I keep playing. Visiting that. Cousin fixed there the tent we are. In the All right. Large Thank you. Okay, so what's at issue is a, is, a car is a paradigm that was invented by Conine and her colleagues, uh, which was all behavioral, in which she took words with initial uh, stop consonants and found versions of them that were midway between voiced and unvoiced uh, when heard independently, and then put them in contexts of various kinds. In her case, they were preceding contexts, not following, because everybody would take it as obvious that only the preceding context could really be doing the work, right? So, uh, and got behavioral results that what people reported they heard was indeed that which was forced, if you want to think of it that way, by the context. Well, what can we do with this paradigm? Well, firstly, we can design various different kinds of contexts, and I'll give you some examples of that, and use this as the basis for turning the observation from natural conversations from data like Natasha's into an experimental body, uh, into a, a, a real investigation uh, uh, where we can really uh, parametrically vary the many aspects of uh, the experience that we're giving subjects. And now the question is, can we uh, collect data, not just behavioral reports, but some indicators that now have been alleged to be indicators in brain imaging of conscious experience uh, and use that as the fundamental uh, tool uh, uh, for developing a real body of knowledge about what kinds of uh, things actually work. And this, uh, this is interesting to me because there's also a history of paradigms uh, in which uh, discussions of the firstly in the case of language, developed in part by Merrill, uh, and more recently uh, by Ferreira and her colleagues, on the persistence of a local meaning or a local structure in a sentence that turns out not to be the one that is actually needs to be computed. It's locally ambiguous, but in fact it's not ambiguous in the context of the whole sentence. And yet there's evidence 
that the totally irrelevant, unnecessary, uh, distracting meaning persists in certain ways and can be brought back into consciousness. Uh, and there's a line of research by uh, Mary uh, and Jay and John Allen and also Jay and Mary uh, that is very suggestive about ways of thinking about how context that's manipulated uh, can interact again with aspects of a stimulus, in this case a visual stimulus, which are not the actual obvious target, but which are the an interpretation of the visual stimulus, which is not the one, in Mary's language, is the ground rather than the figure, uh, but nonetheless can be shown to have an impact in relation to a context uh, that can actually have neurological or at least EEG uh, uh, effects. And so um, I, I think that, again, this is an intuition at the moment, uh, but uh, I hope to be uh, working with Jay and uh, also to try to ensnare Mary into some ideas uh, and uh, uh, really again turn this into a real studyable uh, phenomenon. Uh, and of course uh, in today's world it's not enough if you want to get something published uh, to show that you've got, a, I mean sometimes it's enough but in general it's better if you want to get something published, not only to show that there's some passive brain uh, response to a particular manipulation, but also that you can stop it uh, with some sort of magic beam. Uh, and <clears throat> locally, I'm a colleague of uh, not just Jay's, but uh, also Stuart Hemerov, uh, and, uh, uh, which is, in, and they are very interested in developing uh, the use of ultrasound, which can be focused, and in fact can triangulate or multi, multi-angulate uh, on uh, particular rather narrowly defined brain areas, internal to the brain, not just to the surface. Uh, and you know, there's some promise there that uh, uh, this also could become part of the way in which we can investigate this. Uh oh, this is going to make me play it again. Our visiting cousin. Our visiting cousin. <laughs> that was better. <laughs> so I have just uh, close this section and then close the talk with the question of what is the unit uh, within which this interesting context effect can occur? <coughs> well, in the large fender, that's a phrase. To dent in the large fender, okay, that's a, that's a phrase. But there's no verb there. So there's no thematic assignment in the usual sense of thematic assignment. But if we had a phase, the to dent weakening the fender, kind of a lame example, but uh, the point about it is that it's no longer to get to the fender in there than it is in the first one. Uh, but uh, there's a verb form that interposes that actually assigns a theme, a thematic uh, uh, role uh, to the to dent, which is the agent of doing something to the fender. Uh, and so that gives it a different status in linguistic theory, in current linguistic theory, uh, which may close off this particular uh, phrase uh, from modifying this, or may strengthen it. I mean, that's an empirical question, whether if it's thematically related to uh, within a phrase, that actually increases the bonding, or the binding, to use a general term that's used for these sorts of things, uh, or whether it actually uh, weakens it. Don't know. But the point is it can be studied. And of course we can also <coughs> back up uh, 50 years and uh, argue that, oh, it must be just the sequence of words that are strongly associated with each other. So for example, we wouldn't expect to get uh, backwards uh, effects in a case like this where a large pillar can have a, can't have a tent in it, it could have a dent in it, but that's not really very highly associated compared with a dent in the fender. And so it's something else we can waste our time killing something that should have died 50 years ago. Uh, okay, so this is what I've gone through. I will just uh, close really with just one major issue uh, which cuts across the cognitive sciences uh, that I, I don't have an immediate elixir for, but which is touched on by many of the points that I have made. And that is 
where does the brain get all this computational power anyway? Uh, in the terms that are used within linguistics, externalizing language, and probably externalizing experience in general, requires some kind of connection to the to neural sensory motor interfaces. Okay, we can grasp that, but the question is whether that's all there is. So Randy Gallistel and others uh, have pointed out that neurons are too slow, they're too limited in uh, uh, how, what they actually, the sort of computational uh, stuff they can do uh, for the vastness of memory and for the speed of computations. And to quote from uh, Randy, in the brain there must be something else somewhere uh, uh, that is uh, playing a role uh, in uh, uh, what really makes consciousness possible and possibly what makes language possible. So there are different options, classic options. One, is th they're all reductionist one way or another because what else can we do? But uh, there are, there's downward reduction. Go find something tinier than a neuron and say, okay, that's it. Then th that's where it all must be really working. Uh, and the thing that's tinier in the neuron is the skeleton that stops the neuron from collapsing on itself otherwise known as microtubules. Uh, and, but maybe that skeleton does something else and there is evidence uh, emerging that with tiny, 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 tiny electrodes uh, that maybe the skeleton itself can take on different uh, charges, different states, and could actually be computational, uh, a computational engine inside each neuron. All right, well that's hypothetical, uh, <laughs> maybe. Uh, or this upward reductionism. We don't think of that normally as reductionist, but let's go to the whole brain and look at the oscillations at different frequencies and when they're in phase and when they're out of phase. Uh, and uh, uh, how that all interacts with the sensory motor interfaces to get behave, you know, to get stimuli in and analyze and to get behavior out uh, as the uh, interface. And then finally, there's a very interesting possibility uh, and in, in this case, I'm going to close the content part of this talk uh, with a quote from a letter that Noam sent me in 1969. So I was fussing intellectually. I'd, be, I'd graduated a few years earlier uh, and um, uh, had a job where I didn't have to teach, so all I could think about was whatever it is I was thinking about. Uh, I didn't have to worry about what students were thinking about it, although that was terribly boring and that's why I left that job. But nonetheless, in thinking about just what I could think about, I became puzzled as to ask, the, extent, the extent to which aspects of language don't seem to have an obvious biological basis. And by obvious biological basis, I, I use reference, for example, to color vision. So color vision has uh, the fact that red is the opposite so-called of green and yellow and blue and so on. This has physiological uh, correspondence at any rate, and we can say explanations. Uh, but in the case of language, nothing like that seemed so clear. And so I was toying with uh, ideas as to what kind of non-physiological constraints would structure language to be the way it is. I was in New York. I was surrounded by a bunch of Platonists, uh, uh, linguistics Platonists, uh, Terry Langendon, who was my good friend and colleague, Paul Postel, uh, and um, Jerry Katz, also a good friend and colleague. Postel was a good colleague. <laughs> I didn't know him as well as the others. Uh, so, and they were developing the idea that language is a platonic form. Grammar is a platonic form. Grammar is uncaused. It's like numbers. And of course, Noam is pointing out today, well, it is a little bit like numbers, but not necessarily because it's a platonic form. Maybe, and what Noam wrote to me, I wrote, I wrote Noam a sort of anguished letter as a recent student, uh, having finally discovered to some extent what syntax was about and that it wasn't entirely a cult. Uh, I wrote to Noam and explained my quandary that it, what, what do we do about aspects of language which don't seem to have an obvious biological 
or psychological in the sense of extended from cognition or something. Cause, what, what category are they? And Noam wrote me a letter which may be buried in one of the filing cabinets that has followed me around for the last 50 years, or may not, uh, in which he said, which I remember very clearly because it was like a boom. He said, well, maybe there's a natural law that we don't understand yet that actually applies when you have a bunch of multi-state entities, elements, this was the day of transistors, so people were thinking of transistors as a model, uh, about the size of a grapefruit, big grapefruit. Uh, uh, there's some natural law which applies to that particular kind of configuration in a way, and we were talking about language in that case, not consciousness, but in a way uh, that results in making language conscious, uh, possible. Well, I've been hearing that again lately as a, as a possible, we don't know what that law will be, but of course, that's by definition, we don't know what that law is or will be. But it opens up a possibility since in the history of science, there are plenty of instances in which what turns out to be a natural law was governing some phenomenon or phenomena that weren't understood uh, until they were analyzed in, with reference to a particular natural law. And so that may be where we're headed, uh, into outer space, so to speak, uh, or not. I mean, it, it, but I at least wanted to outline it as an option. Uh, and I really hope I someday, when I have nothing else to do but to go through my filing cabinets, the way Merrill did when he was retiring, uh, and, and tearing up most of the paper, that maybe I'll come across uh, Noam's letter. Anyway, back to the beginning. As I said, quoting uh, uh, Bloomfield, go into linguistics as a career only if you have no moral alternative. But now I hope you understand that in my case, I had no such alternative. <laughs> and so I became what you see here, at last in charge of my life. So there I was not being apprehensive about whether my cheeks were going to be rubbed, but going for a ride. <laughs> so thank you for your attention. <laughs> and I, I'm not sure about the protocol now. Uh, Massimo will, will defame me or something. Okay. And that's for the people. Okay. So yes, I have a little surprise, a little gift for Tom, which is testimonials I have collected from former graduate students, former colleagues, present colleagues, and I'm expecting a few more. But already here, you know, he projected, you know, the slide with the, you know, a long list, illustrious list, former graduate students, colleagues, former, present colleagues. And here I have 10 testimonials. They are very nice, very affectionate. Shows the importance that Tom has had in their academic life and not just the academic life. So I have testimonial here from Jack Carroll, Dick Demers, Meryl Garrett, Rafi Folley, Itziar Laka, Charles Lynn, Erin O'Brien, David Peppel, Dan Slobing, and Mike Tennant House. And I'm expecting a few more. They haven't arrived yet. And I will compose a real booklet of this. But you know, for the time being, this is not elegant <laughs> formally. But you know, please have it. It's nice, nice moving, mo moving testimonials. Now, let me very briefly tell you a couple of anecdotes about Tom. So years ago, not so many years ago, but some years ago in Italy, I was teaching Introduction to Cognitive Science, and I had distributed to the students the original paper that Noam has mentioned, famous paper with the click you know, experiment. And at the time, it was before, you know, now you can send papers in an email, but at the time, we had photocopies, in distributed photocopies. Okay. So uh, a student in that, it was a class of about 20, uh, a student said, you know, uh, did they do this with adults? I say, yes, these are adults. I say, well, have they done this with children? 
I said, well, you know, good, I don't know, I'll have to ask him. And everybody laughed. They said, why are you laughing? You mean he's still alive? <laughs> <laughs> The, the second personal anecdote, but it's, it concerns Tom and Meryl as well. I wouldn't be here. I am, have been here all, almost 20 years now. I wouldn't be here, you know, except for Tom and Meryl. Tom, at the time, he was the head of the linguistic departments. So Donata Vercelli, my wife, had had an offer here. And I say, well, Tucson, Arizona, I have good friends there. Why not? Why not? You know, we were in Milan. We weren't very happy in Milan. And then, and, and really, I owe it to Tom and to Mary the fact that now I am here. I'm very grateful to both of them. And now I think it's your turn. No, it's, it's. Your turn. Well, that's, that's true. Of course, there's a, ma a mandatory first line on occasions like this. It was a long time ago, <laughs> 1965, actually, when Tom and I met at MIT. And uh, it was in a dinky little room in building E10. And uh, that was then the home of the MIT psychology department, which is now uh, transmogrified into brain and cognitive science. I think that's how I remember it. Perhaps I'm wrong. Maybe Tom would contradict me, but probably not. Anyway, you would walk quite a few miles before you would find two more disparate individuals, the, uh, the uh, naive farm kid from Montana and the sophisticated young man from Massachusetts meeting for the first time. Uh, the two states starts with an M. That's about it. Uh, we were there ostensibly to talk about science, and we, and we did talk about science eventually. But the subtext, subtext of these kinds of circumstances is, of course, uh, who is this guy anyway? Uh, we, we were brought together by our joint uh, contacts and interactions with Jerry Fodor. Uh, but apart from that, we didn't have much to go on. Uh, and there was, uh, after a little cautious chat, Tom was ready to let me know what uh, problems there might be with my PhD dissertation, which featured lots of experiments on uh, click location, which Tom and Jerry had already been working on, so he was a one up on me right away. Uh, I, I really think he was just trying to get a rise out of me. And I, of course, was not gonna cooperate and take the bait. So it was the best kind of meeting you can have. And after a little while, and all things settled down, we could both see in each other something that we liked. And that was uh, the beginning of a, uh, a very rich and enduring friendship that has persisted and encompassed our professional and uh, personal lives in several decades since. And you can do the math. <laughs> and the work that Jerry and Tom and I did together at MIT was foundational for me, and it, it gave me the framework that persisted throughout the rest of my professional career. Uh, and we were living, as everybody here is well and truly well aware of, in an incredible time of uh, flex, uh, flux in linguistics and cognitive science and psychology and computer science and pretty much everything across, across that spectrum. Uh, it was a confusing, stimulating, rewarding time. Uh, we were right where we needed to be, and so it was an extraordinary experience. Uh, so the science, uh, as I said, I'm not going to talk about. It's been quite satisfactorily uh, productive, and Tom is still at it, as you are so very well aware. Uh, he'll stay in the traces till the end. It's a family tradition. But now, the, out, outside the man uh, uh, in the laboratory in, in, in real life. And hit, I want to start with a bit that I have celebrated for uh, many, many years. Uh, early on, I learned that Tom is a very good cook. Uh, he, he knows how to cook a steak. He makes a mean marinara sauce. And he taught me a dish that I've been using 
uh, since a joint vacation that our two families took uh, on Saint, in St. John uh, in the Caribbean, camping on the beach, uh, sleeping in a couple of tents, cooking on a picnic grill. Um, there we were with our, our two families. So how Tom managed to have the materials to do this, I don't know. But he did contrive to build us a beautiful dinner of carbonara. Now, not the elegant uh, kind of uh, Italian dish that's, you know, the pancetta and the egg and the parmesan and the pasta. This is better thought of as carbonara rusticana. No pancetta, but uh, bacon will do. Uh, and then there's the finely chopped leftover meat from last night's pork chops. A bit of caramelized chopped onion and green pepper combined with some spices and se seasoning. And the final creamy combination of the eggs and the parmesan. So, it was spectacular. Okay? So, Tom, you're not just another brilliant academic. You're a multifaceted genius. Let's face it. <laughs> now that's one story. I'm going to tell you another quick one. Uh, and it's again with our two families spending some time together at Lake Winnipesaukee, where Tom uh, had a, a house on the, on the lake. And Tom and I were working on our parts of the book that we were working on with Jerry Fodor. And work was for the day, but in the evening was for family. And there were many, many memorable summer nights in the porch of the old farmhouse that we were living in that where for dining and drinking and talking while the kids fell asleep. Uh, there's lots more to say about that. It was a really nice time. It's a mundane but quite lovely memory that uh, I cherish. Uh, and here's the last different flavored memory. It's very TGB. I was visiting Tom, visiting Tom when he was at Rochester, and that visit was to be followed by a visit to, uh, to a Buffalo. And in the planning, I asked Tom for some advice about you know, the transition from one place to the next. Tom said, not to worry, I'll take care of it. And so now we come face to face with uh, Tom's insouciant response to inconvenience. Got a travel problem? Call a taxi. <laughs> And so I got in the taxi and went for my longest taxi ride from Rochester to Buffalo. And it didn't cost me a penny. You can't beat that. <laughs> so, well, it's, our, our careers uh, uh, took us in different directions over the years, but the separation was in space and not spirit. And uh, here we are today in the same locale once again. And I'm grateful to have been part of the forces that brought us to this same place. It's splendid to be here with you, Tom. And uh, the best of all wishes for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm incredibly honored to have this chance to wish Tom a happy birthday and to thank him for years of friendship and mentoring. I understood Tom's uh, mind a little bit uh, better when I did a reprint. I edited the classic paper from 1970, which I see it's as relevant today <laughs> as it was then. And now we know it contains Tom's epitaph. That's the one with the horse. Um, so the relevant section of that paper has the title, Three Aspects of Language Behavior but then goes on into including um, eight unnumbered sections, two of them with the word conclusion, and an extra B subsection when there is no preceding A subs subsection. <laughs> so re-editing that paper provided me with a fresh opportunity to appreciate that Tom can get away with murder <laughs> because uh, how on earth did the editor of that book accept the paper in that state is a mystery. But um, also in re-editing that, I found myself facing a deep text with endless possibilities for argument or organization. The paper was the written equivalent of one of those Escher paintings, which with their impossible perspectives, like the upstairs that go up and down. And, 
um, they capture precisely the true nature of reality. So I discovered that Tom gets glimpses of uh, the truth, just like an artist visualizes the essence of human nature. Um, he achieves like a sort of bird's view of the mental world, while at the same time identifying many pieces of the puzzle that he combines and then recombines again in different ways, as it became clear today once again. So most of us do not have the same capacities, but we have had the privilege of listening firsthand. Um, so for the youngsters in the room, um, we learned that we either look for new ways of blending different fields and frameworks, um, or we will never figure out language. We also need to ask questions as bold as his that seem impossible to verify with empirical research, but um, Tom's work always reminds us that there are ways always ways to test those questions empirically. But perhaps some members of the audience do have indeed those uh, similar talents. And I would like to warn them, though, um, that you do not get to address all those aspects of language seriously and simultaneously like Tom does. Just by having an unusual intelligence or a tremendously creative mind, you get to do that by having an overwhelming capacity to build interdisciplinary and diverse teams and sustain them throughout time. You get to do that by making lifelong friends who want to partner with you in science. And sometimes that, invol uh, that involves a lot of food and social gatherings. <laughs> you get to do that by taking personal care of every one of your students and by achieving a healthy combination of social and professional relationships. In sum, the simple truth is that you get to do good science when you are a good and generous person. All of us who chose to write the thesis under Tom's supervision were drawn to this bright mind with an impeccable sense of fairness and to his enormous human quality, which made him hold an interest in each and every personal circumstance of each one of his students. Although in retrospect, I think he also has a fondness for gossip. Above all, we would not resist to be lured. But we could not resist to be lured by the intellectual respect with what he treats his students as colleagues. The interdisciplinary atmosphere that he created at Rochester was a dynamic community. He always had a dinner in his house for invited speakers and graduate students that he cooked himself. And he made a point of not letting faculty appear until dessert time. In his lively week weekly lab meetings, uh, he always had genuine questions along with the pizza. Um, he was always truly curious. One time he told me, explain this to me as if I were a 12 year old. Remember, my attention span is very short. He integrated all kinds of people in his team, even those whose social graces placed them on the sidelines. He kept them in his, in his team for years, providing for a productive environment for all. I think that for him, there is no job good enough for each of his academic children. If he could, he would have probably kept us all nearby. When in 2010, I, uh, Dr. Itzirlaka and I organized a course in Spain to commemorate the 40 years after Tom's classic paper, Everyone we invited wanted to come. Uh, very, vis very busy, world-renowned researchers made space in their agendas to come to, to come to Spain to pay homage to Tom. And the convivial atmosphere showed that their relationships were based on more than academic collaborations. The only problem with Tom is that he's uh, very good at hiding his huge humanity behind a powerful voice, a beard sometimes, and the frequent uh, witty comments that scare the hell out of everyone around. The witty comments are always very funny, but you can never aspire to have an equally witty response. So if you want to shine as a smart arse, uh, you're better off avoiding his company or you will come out as his inferior. <laughs> I'm not sure if it was Gandhi or the script writers at Big Bang Theory who said, live as if you were going to die tomorrow. Learn as if you were going to live forever. But I think Tom must have read that somewhere. Today, um, he assigned us homework. Uh, but as always, he will get to it faster. 
So I will try to keep myself healthy to be invited to his 100th birthday, and maybe we can get some answers and more homework. In the meantime, I hope that all of us here, inspired by his perseverance, contribute to find those answers and also remember that genius without humanity does not make science advance. Fierce competition for scarce positions, uh, chronic individualism, and even social isolation are some of the defining features of our times. Whether bright minds can create unique work pieces in those conditions is unclear to me. Science is as much a social as an academic enterprise in which face-to-face -face interactions and relaxed encounters, not always constrained by busy schedules, lead to these new ideas and synergies. Honest collaboration among different disciplines is essential, whether administrators understand it or not. In sum, uh, genius plus an enormous dose of human quality is what turned Tom and the other members of today's distinguished panel into some of the founders of a fantastic discipline, cognitive science, that is destined to discover precisely what makes us truly human. So thank you very, very much for your guidance. In the name of the many students who have ever been under your supervision, thank you. First, I, I, I have to say that, that I, I have to say loudly, <laughs> uh, th this is an unbelievable event for me. Um, so many brilliant uh, scholars here, so many old friends, and so many students who are destined to be brilliant scholars and I hope friends. A little known, <coughs> sorry, a little known fact is that I am in fact quite emotional. Uh, and sometimes an event, an event like this can stimulate that, of course. Um, but I try not to let it show. <laughs> It's part of, probably part of the pressure that leads to the so-called witty remarks to try to deflect uh, emotion. Just a few things about what Merrill and Monse have said. Uh, Merrill's first meeting in mine, I do recall, but I recall it in a slightly different way, although consonant with what he said. The weekend before we were going to meet, I knew there was this guy. I expected him to have a piece of straw coming out of his mouth and you know, all that. <laughs> uh, but he had written a dissertation. And I took it to the summer house where my family had uh, had as a retreat uh, in New Hampshire. And I ruined the entire weekend reading uh, Merrill's dissertation and figuring out what was wrong with it. Uh, of course, because, as he said, of course, I had a vested interest. I mean, I was working on clicks and, and uh, invented a way of doing it that uh, was Rube Goldberg, but worked, and uh, working with Jerry. Uh, and here's this guy who actually was slightly, he didn't say this, but he was slightly ahead of us. The fundamental idea of using clicks, in fact, I think Merrill brought to Jerry when Jerry was um, uh, on sabbatical at Illinois. And when they got tired of running down to the pasture and scaring the cows, uh, they um, you know, would actually talk about stuff. And when Jerry came back, he said, you know, there's this really interesting guy and he's doing this stuff. You know, maybe we should think about that. So actually, indirectly, uh, Merrill really started the ball rolling at any rate and gave it some mighty pushes along the way. Uh, but we had the meeting in which I was uh, loaded for bear in the parlance and uh, proceeded to 
explain to Merrill what was wrong. And you know, there were a lot of diff issues. There's always something wrong. Uh, and Merrill was just sitting there going, when is this young man going to stop? <laughs> I mean, it wasn't unpleasant. It was just clear. He was tolerant, uh, friendly, and I began to get bored. <laughs> and that's when things really became positive. Uh, as forever, including today. As far as Monse is concerned, as, as a student, Monse was a special student, as I think you can tell. But I had many special students, it's true. I tried to figure out, as related to this event, how many PhD students I've had as the primary dissertation advisor, never mind being on committees. I'm not on committees very much. I think people realize that I might not be as helpful as they want uh, <laughs> for their student or for themselves. Uh, but conversely, I end up being the advisor of a good number of students. And um, the number is somewhere between 70 and 75 uh, since I started. Uh, many of them, in terms of the worldly rewards and so on, many of them more distinguished than I am. Name chairs, this, that, and the other thing, and so on. Uh, and uh, that's, that's good. But what is this, what, why so many? Well, unlike a man who's known well to somebody in this room, Julie Hochberg, who was a good friend whom I really love, who, who I gave a very hard time to when I was in his department and he was department head. Not that I was giving it to him, but I was giving it to everybody around me. Uh, but he really focused like a laser on his students, uh, and even on his colleagues like me. I'd wake up at six in the morning to a phone call from Julie, and Julie would say, we've had some conversation the preceding day, and he would say, well, you know, I gave another thought to uh, what we were talking about, and I actually think, Young Bever, that you should think about it this way. He called me Young Bever. Uh, uh, but the point is, for him, the night was just an inconvenience that interrupted our conversation. And I know he was like that with his graduate students, and I admired it, but that wasn't me. I think in part the reason I have had the good fortune to work with and have so many brilliant students, uh, I don't know if I should say this in the hearing of any administrators, I leave them alone. <laughs> The main thing I, I want a student to do is to be smart, uh, be hardworking, dot all the I's and the T's in, in the actual work you're doing, don't break the equipment, and don't sleep in the lab. I've had some who did. <laughs> That's why I learned to have that injunction. Uh, and I guess I've been fortunate that the kind of student that wants to be treated that way, some do, some don't, is the kind in almost always that will flourish with that kind of treatment. So it's been a kind of easy ride, if you want to think about it, compared to what Julie does. I mean, Julie really, his life is, he's a brilliant scientist, but his life was also daily wrapped up with the details of what each student was doing when and so on. Uh, so I, I've just been lucky in that regard too, not just in having had marvelous advisors initially, marvelous early colleagues, but also self-selecting students uh, that um, value the quips. Occasionally I do have some insight when a student is having a problem with data to how to help the student unsnarl it, that's true. I don't think I'm really specially gifted at that, but maybe I know when to apply it. I don't know. Uh, but that's been a marvelous part of my career. I mean, it, 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 it's, if you looked at the panoply of stuff I did and how I did it, enormous number, an enormous amount of collaboration across many different faculty, I mean, many different senior people with accomplishments of their own, and students. Because, as Monse said, research is a social act for me. Uh, and
and the fact that it has produced some knowledge is a benefit. So thank you all for coming. I thank especially uh, uh, Valeria and Massimo, but most especially Olga for the tremendous amount of work that went into just getting this, the structure of this organized and providing for me a, a unique memory, a unique life event uh, that's tremendously rewarding and lasting. Thank you. Hi, I'm Natasha Warner, and I'm here speaking as the um, head of the linguistics department, and I'll keep this really short. I didn't meet Tom until the year 2000 when he interviewed me and hired me for this department, so my stories don't go back that far. Um, and I've been sitting here thinking of times when I've been especially happy to work with Tom, and some of them were early in my time here when he was really supportive of me as a junior faculty member and as a woman, um, junior faculty member. Um, and those were wonderful things. And I'll tell you specifics that I'm thinking of later. Um, but I've also been thinking about how, as we've um, been hearing about how Tom has supervised many graduate students, he currently supervises a lot of graduate students. Um, some of them are here. And um, as department head, I'm especially grateful to him for supervising such a large number of graduate students currently as well. Um, and seeing that they all submit grants and do all of these wonderful things and so on. Um, yeah, I've also been thinking in terms of times that I'm especially glad to work with Tom. There have been some times in meetings when he really stood up for what was right, and I appreciated that. And there are also times in meetings, um, Noam used the word endearing at one point, about something about things that Tom does sometimes when we're in a meeting and maybe we're dealing with something difficult and he breaks out in the biggest, sweetest smile. And I just love that smile and I love that when that happens. Um, and that is endearing. Anyway, um, it's been wonderful to hear all of this today. I've really enjoyed all of the talks, all of the presentations. And um, I guess I want to say thank you also to Massimo, Olga, and Valeria for organizing this. And I want to say, happy birthday, Tom. <laughs>